I think I first read about Kobe Bryant in 1995. I was a young kid way out in rural Kentucky pouring over a basketball recruiting magazine when he first crossed my eyes. There at the top of the rankings was a small black and white photo of some smiley kid named Kobe. I actually remember thinking at the time, Kobe, hmm, interesting name, 30 points per game, national player of the year, he must be good. I had no idea what was coming. A short time later, I asked a question that would become commonplace when it came to Kobe. That Spinley two guard is really gonna jump from high school to the NBA? Is he serious? For the first of many times, Kobe was in fact serious. And Jerry West's equal seriousness should have been an indicator to us. West had quietly maneuvered to draft Kobe at 13 after a deal with the Charlotte Hornets. And just like that, the Lakers had secured a teenager that would go on to become one of the most important basketball players of all time. I wouldn't actually get to see Kobe play in real game action until some time later, but his presence and influence within basketball culture, especially for a kid at my age, was significant and immediate. He was highly marketable, so he was everywhere. The slam photo shoots, the Adidas commercials, the video games, the way he somehow became the only NBA player that I can ever remember that doubled as a teen heartthrob. His star power was just glaringly apparent from the jump. Kobe was the golden boy for the future of the NBA, so it was only fitting that he would wear gold and purple for the Lakers. To be an NBA player, confidence is a necessary thing, but Kobe had an almost Kanye way of talking about himself. Teammates and veterans would laugh about how badly and how quickly he wanted to be the man, but at the same time, they were peeking over their shoulders as he worked and worked tirelessly to get better. There was something either delusional or prophetic about his behavior. And within a year, that familiar question had already popped up again. How could a rookie have the audacity to ask for crunch time shots in a playoff game, airball the first one, and then shoot three more consecutive airballs? And then, how does this second year player, a teenager, have the nerve to ask Michael Jordan for the torch when he still lives with his parents? Is he serious? The Lakers front office always believed in Kobe's future, and as a result, they got to work optimizing the roster around the two MVP caliber players that they had in their starting lineup. For their success, it was huge. For my own enjoyment, I have to be honest, they became my least favorite team in the league. The charm of those freewheeling, youthful Laker teams was gone. By the time they were defending their first title, they had morphed into a fantastic villain because they were so damn good. There were massive and very visible cracks in the foundation, though. On court, Shaq and Kobe formed one of the most lethal partnerships in the history of basketball. Off court, it was almost perfectly and gloriously wrong. Shaq was one of the most physically gifted and dominant forces in the history of the NBA, but he could get by with subpar effort a lot of the time. Kobe was physically gifted too, don't get it wrong, but his approach couldn't have been more in contrast than it was next to Shaq, and their grading personalities would never mesh in a lasting way. It speaks to the dominance of these players, both of whom were top 20 players ever and in their primes, that they were able to bitterly and publicly feud to the extent that they did and still win three titles in a row. When they were clicking, they were basketball's version of the board. Resistance was futile but it wasn't built to last. The sexual assault accusation against Kobe in the summer of 2003 was the Mason Dixon line of his career, and nothing was really ever the same after that. Like a lot of people, I didn't know what to make of those charges. Is this guy even who I thought he was? Our golden boy was tarnished and put in a whole new light. He lost sponsorships, further damaged his relationship with Shaq, and slipped into a time where his image became a real talking point. Kobe had won three titles at this point, and he was arguably the best player in the league by 2003, but this still felt insane. Is he seriously going to let this once-in-a-lifetime pairing blow up over a childish feud? When the Lakers lost to the Pistons in the finals in 2004, I danced around the room. I laughed when they walked off the court and ceased to be a team. I thought that basketball was better for it. I don't know that I was right about that. A lot of things would change in the next few years for Kobe and the Lakers. Phil Jackson was fired and then rehired after warring with a now traumatized and frustrated Kobe. Kobe was free of Shaq and going absolutely nuclear on the NBA, but the winning was compromised. I enjoyed Kobe's offensive eruptions in 06 and 07 like anybody else, but the entire time I couldn't help but sit back and think, is this really what he wanted? 
He was the most unstoppable offensive force on the planet, but didn't he say that winning was the most important thing to him? Something had to change, because despite his roaring and virtuosic scoring sprees, he'd become one of the most negatively charged names in sports. To shake it, he'd have to submit himself to a complete rebrand that would include changing his number and reinventing his public persona. I was both amused and annoyed by the fact that Kobe gave himself a nickname, especially one as absurd as Mamba. On one level, okay, it's kinda accurate and cool. On another, back the truck up. First of all, you don't give yourself a nickname. Everybody knows that. Second, you don't publicly say that you read about an animal and then say, that's what I want my game to be like. Is he serious? Even still, for this to fully work, the Lakers would also have to change their direction. And they did. They orchestrated deals to add key contributors in Pau Gasol, Trevor Ariza, and Lamar Odom. They drafted Andrew Bynum. Kobe finally had a winning cast of characters to support him in the post shaq era. They were great again, reaching the finals in 2008, 2009, and 2010, and winning two of the three. In top form from 2001 to 2008, Kobe Bryant was one of the most stunningly graceful, high-motored, intelligent, explosive, and skillful players that I've ever seen. In the first three years of Kobe's career, on any given night, there was no telling what he might have the nerve to try, because none of us were totally sure where his boundaries were. Things really got scary around the time Kobe turned 21 and he began to physically mature and add functional strength to go along with that elite burst and gracefulness. Now instead of those chaotic forays to the rim where he might attempt a circus shot, he was hitting people head on in the lane and finishing through contact. There was no bullying him now, and thus there was no stopping him. Of course, it's difficult to have any conversation about his game without at some point bringing up Michael Jordan. MJ was his hero, and the influence was unmistakable. Kobe could have been any kind of player that he wanted, but imagine mimicking your hero, who also was arguably the best player ever, to that extent, and having that much success. Everybody wanted to be like Mike, and Kobe got the closest. He played mental games on and off the court. He made a living off of high volume, mid-range dribble shooting. He was also a terror as a defender. Specifically in the early days, Kobe was the choice to defend the other team's best player or pressure at the point of attack. Miles of wear and tear would slow down his disruptiveness over time, but there's very little doubt that Kobe was one of the most impactful two-way players ever to play. Mentally and physically, Kobe was a legendary and maniacal competitor and tough as an adamantium suitcase. The man tore his Achilles and got up to shoot the free throws. I once heard Kobe say that he identified with both Miles Teller and J.K. Simmons characters from the movie Whiplash. I always thought that that said a lot. Those characters seem haunted by the idea of saying, That was alright. Good job. Kobe took immense criticism for playing what people perceived as a selfish style of basketball. True as that might have been at times, it's hard to argue with the results. He went to the playoffs in 16 of his 20 seasons. He won five NBA titles and played in seven NBA finals. He won the MVP in 2008, two gold medals in 2008 and 2012. He made first team all NBA 11 times and first team all defense nine times. That same audacity and nerve was the likely reason for why there were so many big moments throughout Kobe's career. I distinctly remember thinking that the Lakers had broken through when Kobe coolly threw that absurd lob pass to Shaq against the Blazers in 2000. A few games later, I remember thinking that Kobe had just broken through when I watched him coolly torch the Pacers in games four and six of the finals that same year. There were countless posters, the ocean of 30 and 40 point games. How about the 10 game stretch in 0506 when he averaged 45 and a half points per game on nearly 50% shooting? That stretch was capped off by the second biggest scoring performance performance of all time, an 81 point whopper against the helpless Toronto Raptors. My personal favorite moment of Kobe's career came in the wee hours of the morning in the summer of 2008. I still remember sitting up alone in my college bedroom as I watched Team USA fight Spain for the gold medal in the Beijing Olympics. The game was close as they neared the finish, and then something interesting happened. I found myself rooting for Kobe for the first time in several years. I mean, how could you not root for him? It was so obvious that what we were watching was special. It was greatness. A league full of stars vying for his spot at the top, and he calmly said, I got this. Even on the very last night of his career, he was determined to give a full-on bear hug to the moment. Who in a broken down 37-year-old body has the gall to attempt 50 field goals to score 60 points? 
Kobe f***ing Bryant. That's who. Kobe took a lot of criticism during the years when the titles weren't coming. It got especially bad at the end when the Mamba mentality was there, but the Mamba physicality was not. He stayed stubborn as the injuries piled up nearly as high as the losses. I remember thinking several times, is he seriously going to go out like this? As bad as it got, Kobe still never flinched. All the competitors, all the noise, all the poking fun, and Kobe never ran away from the fray. He leaned into it. He saw the caricatured version of himself as an opportunity and he said, this is who I am. A beautiful, cathartic part about the last phase of Kobe's life was that he flipped some of those criticisms around and turned them into his purpose. This person, who'd taken grief throughout his career for not elevating his teammates or sharing enough, had seemingly dedicated himself to elevating the women's game and sharing with the next generation of players. Maybe it was just a function of getting older and chilling out a little bit. Maybe it was just a function of having four young daughters, as his teammates have suggested. Whatever the cause, Kobe seemed like a noticeably happier person. And coolest of all, a dialed-in parent. In a sports world chock full of superstars and big names, Kobe's name rang like an iron bell. It rang and reverberated across the world in a way that I'm not sure Americans will ever fully be able to grasp. And how often does a person's name become a mantra and an adjective? Kobe and Mamba have become synonymous with brazen self-belief. He so insisted on setting himself apart that he'd almost passed into an existence as an idea. I'm not sad because we failed to tell Kobe how great he was. We told him all the time, and to be honest, that was part of Kobe's charm. He knew. I'm sad that we're not going to get to see all the things that Sage Mamba was going to tackle as he aged gracefully. I'm sad that we were just getting to know Gianna through Kobe's excited perspective as a father. I see now that that shameless audacity to take what he loves so seriously, to be so stubbornly unafraid to fail and to say and do cartoonishly silly things, that was the stuff that stirred up so much protest in his critics and so much adoration in his fans. I guess I was a little bit of both, but I never once looked away. No matter how cynical I got about his persona, I was right there with everyone else. Jumping off of my couch and pumping my fist when he had the guts to walk unfazed into the moment and bend it to his will. This man just always had the nerve, and I'm really going to miss Kobe Bryant for that. Let me know if you agree.